Thank you uh, so much for coming to uh, our Bible study tonight. We're continuing in our one-to-one -one series, and I appreciate you uh, being part of this. I hope that it benefits you and encourages you. Um, tonight's focus that we are looking at, and for those that are on video, we will be um, kind of diving deep into the divine solution, um, meaning who is Christ and, and what has he done. And then um, from that, we're going to take some time and go through what is our response. Okay, so Jesus has died and offered a solution for sin, but then given that fact, once we discover it, how should we respond? Um, and again, uh, just a reminder to all of us, really, what we're doing here is we're, we're learning and growing, but we're also recognizing that this is um, important because we would potentially be leading someone either who is new to their faith and trying to just understand some foundational pieces about uh, Christianity, or uh, we might be leading or um, um, presenting Christ uh, to someone who does not know yet know Jesus. And so um, we're kind of pretending or there might be some times where I talk about the student, and obviously that's what we're referring to. That would be the individual that we are um, spending time with, discipling, encouraging, and praying for. Um, so I just want to take a minute, and obviously uh, we're going to dive in on page 26 of your study, um, but before we do, I want to just take a moment and say, where were we? And we talked particularly about the mission of Jesus, remembering, recognizing scripturally that um, Christ came with a purpose, and I've said before, uh, and it probably sounds like a resounding gong, but I want to make sure that we really solidify the understanding that uh, Jesus's mission or the fact that Jesus came being fully God and fully man um, to the earth to live upon it, to die upon a cross, and to then rise from the grave and triumph over sin and death and then be seated at the right hand of the Father is what I've always said is God's plan A. And that's just so important to remember and recognize that this was not an afterthought by God. This was not a Hail Mary pass. This was not a desperation attempt by God saying, I've done everything, I don't know what else to do, so I'm just going to throw everything you know, out with the, the you know, kitchen sink and just hope that somehow, some way, this works. And we saw that scripturally through, obviously, the prophets um, speaking, and then we looked into uh, the prophet Isaiah and discovered that it was God's will to beat, bruise, and crush the Savior for our iniquities and our sins, which verifies that indeed, you know, God was saying, this is the plan that I have. And so we looked at that, and then we discovered um, the reason that there was a mission of Jesus, and we looked kind of into our problem, the problem of man. And the one kind of thing that I would just encourage us in um, when we are taking somebody through uh, this study is uh, to, to take time in that, and, and I just would say, um, it's probably a challenging portion. You know, in our human pride, we don't like to discover that we are in need of something or that we are broken and that we can't fix it ourselves. Um, but I think that the more that we spend time there, lovingly, patiently, prayerfully with the individual, um, the greater potential understanding and response of truly who Jesus is and the joy that we have in Christ for what he has done for us um, is there. And so um, we just don't want to minimize or cheapen grace and we don't want to sort of skirt the issue of uh, the fact that apart from Jesus we have no means uh, to be at right standing or holy before God. And so praise God for Jesus. Obviously that's why we worship him. So with it um, tonight, then, we're going to dive into the second portion, which, again, is on page 26, the divine solution. Um, and so at the top, we read, God's unalterable law is death for sin. Um, and so there's a little note, and we need to recognize that this was promised um, to Adam as well as to us. And so we have to realize this is not able to be altered um, because God is holy, because God is righteous, uh, because God is just. He can have no part with sin. Um, and it sounds in some senses unloving, but really it isn't. We recognize that we worship a holy God and praise God for it. The love that God displays is the giving of his son on our behalf so that we might have eternal life. Um, it continues on and it says, he will not brush aside 
our sin or overlook it. And again, that kind of goes back to what I was talking about before, the problem of man helping people to see, hey, the bad news is we are sinners in need of a savior and we can't get to God on our own, which makes the good news all the much more sweet when we understand it. Um, Rather, is it a holy and just God? He requires each of us to pay this penalty of death for our willful independence. And remember last week we talked about really sin kind of at its core is our desire to be independent from God. Leave me alone. I can do it on my own. I don't need you. Um, and we even looked at that in the Genesis account when we looked at Adam and Eve um, in the garden. According to the Bible, uh, there is only one escape from this personal judgment. That escape requires someone else. And if you, if you want... It's up to you, but in, in, in the leader's guide, someone else is underlined. I mean, there's emphasis. Obviously, we know that that is Jesus, but um, we want to make sure that they understand that we, we need somebody else other than ourselves. So that escape requires someone else to pay our uh, death penalty for us. Divine justice would not only be served, but we could be pardoned. So not only are we served justice, but we're pardoned from the penalty that we're due. And again, I've talked about, you know, back when I uh, drove my car at ridiculously high speeds, it was obvious that I was guilty. And the law stated, and I knew exactly what speed I was at, and I knew exactly what was supposed to happen to me according to the law. So I deserved essentially reckless endangerment and loss of a license for six months. And what I received was mercy, which meant I didn't lose my license and was grateful for the judge because I probably then would have lost my job. So I deserved a penalty, but I did not receive it. And that's exactly what Jesus does for us. Um, So divine justice would not only be served, but we could be pardoned. But who in this world is qualified to take our place? What is able to absorb our sin? Um, And so we're going to take a look, and um, we're going to read Matthew 20, verse 28. So if someone wants to look that up and let me know, I'd be happy to come to you. But before we do, we're going to look at the following verses, and we're going to use them as resources to explain to our student or the individual that we're taking through the study how God has sought to free man from the death that has been placed upon him. Once again, the death that we deserve, the penalty that we are due. And so that's what we're discovering right now. So would somebody be willing to read Matthew 20, 28? Kathy, you got it? Awesome. I'll come sneak over there to you. Thank you. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Awesome. Thank you, Kathy. So the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life, and I love that word, as a ransom for many. And so in there, um, what we would want to just write down is that the Son of Man came to give his life as a ransom for many. And then also recognize and really focus in on the idea that ransom is the key word here. Okay? It's a payment for a debt that is obviously owed. And so a ransom payment is, hey, I'm going to pay this to clear you from what you're due. So once again, it's um, Son of Man came to give his life as a ransom for many. And then also you just would want to explain and utilize or kind of focus in on the word ransom as a payment for a debt that was owed due to a penalty that must have been paid. And so now we're going to look at Romans 5, 8 through 9. And so would somebody be willing to read that for us? Romans 5, 8, and 9. You got it? Okay. I'll come to you, Carla. Don't worry. You raise your hand next time. I'll make sure I get you. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we now have been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Thank you. 
Yeah, I mean, we could spend um, you know a whole night talking just about those two verses, and um, you know, I, I love uh, what is stated there that that what you want to write, and then we'll speak to this in a minute, is essentially for the student to see that Christ died for us to save us from God's wrath. That's the, the gist of what's going on. But also, um, you know, when we look at this and when we unpack it, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, right? So undeserving, um, no benefit to, to, to Jesus, no um, kickback or... Um, kind of uh, under the table uh, benefit but God was willing to give his son and um, when we were still enemies of God I mean independent of him uh, Christ died for us and so how much more is the precious blood of Jesus when we recognize what's been done for us Um, personally I mean again allow the spirit to lead but um, not that any of these are more or any less important, but boy, I would, I would really just take some time and kind of, for lack of a better word, let Romans 5, 8, and 9 marinate in them is, is maybe the right analogy. You know, talk to them about it, see if they have questions about it, but if you're kind of going through stuff, um, you know, I would just encourage you to pause or, or, or let that... Um, be spoken to and let them speak and ask questions and, and just let that kind of ruminate through the study because it's um, such, a, such an amazing passage. Um, we're going to now look at 2 Corinthians 5, 21, and we're going to particularly ask a question of what exchange is made here. So that's what we're looking for when we look at uh, this passage, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Carla, you want to you wanna take a shot? You're at it? All right, I want to make sure I get you. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Awesome, thank you. So another amazing passage as well. Um, he made him who knew no sin to become sin for us. So there is the exchange. And so basically, uh, what you would want to write, and we'll talk about this in a minute, is Jesus is exchanging his sinless life for our sinful one. And yes, I recognize for for us tonight, that's fairly obvious, but um, again, for someone who is either newer to the faith or uh, doesn't know Jesus, uh, that's such an important thing to see. And then you would um, kind of follow it up. So Jesus is exchanging his sinless life for our sinful one. And then it's we get his life. He gets our penalty of death. And that's kind of another like, whoa. Um, you know, we get his life. He gets our penalty of death. So that is the great exchange. Um, and then... Um, I'm going to come and, and just kind of show this to you. But again, some people are pictorial in their understanding. Um, and so um, what I would say, this is the illustration for 2 Corinthians 5.21, is if you would you know, do two stick figures, you can make them as pretty or as neat as you want, however you want to do it, just two stick figures side by side. Okay. And so when you have your two stick figures, uh, on the one that would be essentially on the left side of the page, you would write me, and then the one to the right would be Christ. And then below the me, just write a one and a two, And then the one under me write sinful, and the one under two write death. So, again, you would have me, stick figure, below that, and this would be on the, again, the left sort of side of this illustration, 
sinful and death. And then over on the right side, the right stick figure, you would put Christ, the stick figure, and then another one and two. But in those one and twos, you would write sinless and life. And then once you have that, you would just want to take an arrow from essentially death and draw it up to Christ. And then another arrow from life under Christ and direction it toward the me. So there's like an X, the exchange. And I'll, I'll come by, I know. It, you know. This is kind of what we're after. You guys feel good with that. Um, I know this is kind of redundant, but some people just, I've noticed pictorially, they just, they get it this way rather than, this is what we're, what we're doing. Yeah, you guys look good. Feel good? All right, anybody else? Mm-hmm. You get it right? Okay. Again, there's no, there's no failure in here. I just want to make sure that you saw it just to where if you wanted to draw that illustration, um, in this concept, a lot of people get it just through a picture. Um, so um, we see this exchange, and so the next thing that we want to look at in this study is if Christ experienced our death as we have defined it, he then experienced far more than physical pain. Okay, and that's one of the things that is, is uh, the more that I look at it, the more I'm in awe of what Christ has done for us. Notice that the height of Christ's agony on the cross, he did not cry out, my God, it hurts, but, and we're going to discover what he cried out. So if you would be kind enough to turn to Mark 15, we're going to read verses 33 through 34. So if somebody would turn there and if they would be willing. Mark 15, 33 through 34. No? No? <laughs> yeah. Dave, okay, we'll make Dave do it. Dave's, Dave's, Dave's a confident man. He knows what to do. Now, when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Actually, I apologize. I don't know that I had put that on um, uh, the microphone on, but um, you want to read it again? Yeah. You know what? Yeah, it's okay. Again, we're not. Would you, would you do it one more time? <laughs> I did not do that. I promised you I did not do that on purpose. I just want to make sure we get this in the, in the video. So divine providence or something like that. No, God, here's my thought is God knows you're such a wonderful man that he's just like, you know, go ahead, Dave. <laughs> By the way, we know that God has a great sense of humor. So. Now when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Awesome, thank you, yeah. Yeah, we see that, that verse, and that is actually Jesus speaking in Aramaic. Um, we realize that the, uh, the scriptures that we have essentially are written in three languages, the Old Testament, uh, is written in Hebrew, and then we have the New Testament, which is uh, written in uh, what is called Koine Greek, uh, or the Greek of the day, Koine Greek uh, for uh, Jesus. But then also there are some Aramaic sayings, and this is one of the most famous Aramaic sayings. Um, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so um, in that, what you would want to write, and then I'll just speak to this briefly, um, and again, it, it really uh, almost... Uh, brings me to tears when we realize what Jesus truly was experiencing, but um, you just would want to write down, um, he didn't say, my God, it hurts, but my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Um, and then 
to reiterate, forsaken, you would want to put in parentheses, and that is separated yourself from me. And one of the things that I think is, is um, so beautifully painful um, in the display of the love of, of our Savior is when we look at the um, pain, the physical pain that Jesus went through. Um, I do not mean to minimize that whatsoever because obviously being fully human and fully God, um, we have to realize that you know, he felt and um, the excruciating pain of every lash, every beating, every, you know, every piercing, all of what he was enduring. Um, but also what we have to realize is that at the moment that essentially, and I could go on and on, I'll, I'll try to keep this brief, but the first thing that we want to look at is um, I want to tell individuals, you know, Jesus didn't die, okay? And I know people are like, wait a minute, yes, he did. But what we realize when we read in Scripture is we see, particularly in the passage, at the right time, what we read is Jesus when the work was finished, he says, it is finished. And then what does he do? It doesn't say Jesus died. It says he gave up his spirit, meaning that he was fully in control, okay, of the atonement for our sin. And it's a beautiful aspect because visually what we're seeing is, oh my gosh, you know, this plan has gone terribly awry. And if you've ever watched um, The Passion of the Christ, um, it's hard to watch, but there's this, this eerie scene um, right at the end when Jesus is on the cross where you see essentially Satan wandering around. I don't know if you remember it, but it's this he, she, it um, is kind of wandering around as Jesus is essentially saying these words. Um, and I love the, I would say, the theological but the cinematographic representation of what's going on there because visually you're looking like, hey, the enemy's won, right? But what we realize is when the sins have been atoned for, okay, and we'll speak to this in a second, Jesus is separated from God because God is holy. Um, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But also, um, Jesus gives up his spirit. So um, he is in control of when he releases himself to the point of death. Case in point, right, um, and I know this is a little bit, I can't just say, okay guys, I'm gonna give up my spirit, right? I can't just, I command my spirit to leave. I succumb to death, right? Um, and so death overtakes me, but we see that Jesus, at the right point, he's the one that says, okay, it's done, I'm now releasing my spirit to you. So in um, what I would say in tragedy or apparent tragedy, there's actually victory and God is always in control of what's going on. God never loses control over um, his grand plan. Now focusing here though, when we hear the words, my God, my God, uh, why have you forsaken me, separated yourself from me? Recognize that when the sins of mankind are placed upon Jesus, because God is holy, what we know is, is that the intimate aspect between the Father and the Son is now broken. Okay? And to me, um, I, I, think, I think maybe the best way that I can give this is I can't imagine... Um, someone coming to me as a dad and saying, you know, here is, here is a person over here who is obviously guilty of some heinous crime. They don't even care about you. They don't even want you. Um, and I want you to give your son. Okay, so Parker or Maddox or Karis even, right? And she's my daughter, but still Karis. Or Noah, um, who's done nothing wrong. I mean, they are... They are you know, they've done absolutely nothing. And we're going to beat them and destroy them. So not only am I going to watch my kid beat, right, so physically, but there's going to become a point where the intimate connection that we have is broken, right? The, the, the father-son relationship, for lack of a better word, is broken because of what that individual did over there. And in, in honesty, I'm like, man, you know, that makes me angry. 
But that's the love, the deep love of our Father and Christ to be willing to go through that, both the physical and the spiritual agony in order that we, while we were still sinners, might have eternal life. And that's where I look at it. I'm like, man, that's love. Like, wow. Um, and that, that's what drives me to say, oh my gosh, I cannot believe that I have such an amazing Savior. Um, because, yeah, I, I was that guy. You know? Um, and so... Um, that, that's the joy that we see. Um, so, uh, I think I said earlier, what Christ really experienced uh, for us on the cross was the death of separation from God. And during that time of separation, he suffered through fear, guilt, impurity, hopelessness, etc., that our independence brings. Right? So he, he went through all of that. And here's the purpose. All so that we might be pardoned to experience the life which comes from God. He did it all for you and I, and we didn't even want it. Okay? So his substitutionary sacrifice removes the penalty of death imposed on us for our sin. Um, and uh, again, let the Spirit lead on this, I guess, is maybe the right way to put it. There might be a lot of questions. Be patient. Um, you know, uh, maybe use personal testimony, use examples, um, but but let it let it fester, let it marinate, let them wrestle with this, and trust that God is working, and trust that God is leading, um, and um, be patient is maybe the right way to put that. Some people they you know they get it immediately. Okay, I get it. Yeah, you know, I'm a sinner, and I need to ask God for my forgiveness. Other people struggle with it a little bit, and they're like, gosh, you know, I didn't. Can I, am I really that bad? Well, the answer is yes, but all the better. The good news is, is Jesus died for you and you can have life through him. So, um, but that's, that's the divine solution. Um, the exchange of Christ as a sinful person, or a, a non, excuse me, a sinless individual who has life uh, to lose his life for um, us who are sinful and deserved of death. And so we get life because of Christ's death. And so the next thing that we see is our response. And that's where, okay, great. You know, Jesus didn't do this you know, to be on some movie. I mean, there's a, there's a purpose behind this. And the desired um, result is that we would respond to this. This is the whole point of what uh, Christ has done. This is the whole point of, of speaking about Christ. Um, and so in this, uh, we read at the bottom, although Christ's sacrifice provides a solution to our sin and separation from God, it by no means becomes a solution until each of us has personally appropriated it for ourselves. Okay? Um, and so, again, I just want to reiterate, yes, Jesus died on a cross to forgive all of their sin, but he didn't do it just so that everyone is pardoned. Um, we must receive, essentially, uh, what's been given. Okay, so we've been given mercy, we've been given grace, we've been given the gift, but for lack of a better word, uh, we must open it. We must recognize that. Um, and so, uh, would someone be willing to read John 1, verse 12? And we're going to look at who has the right to become children of God? That's a great question. Does anybody have it? Tom, you got it? Okay. Yeah, we're reading John uh, 1, 12. Yeah. Yeah. Yet to all who receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Awesome. Okay. Um, okay. So to all who receive him, he gave the right to become children of God. And so in the um, line there, what you would want to just fill in is to as many as choose to receive him, right? And I know this is kind of redundant, and just bear with me in this, but again, what you might want to encourage you know, it's not like, um, uh, I know, I, I'm, I'm going to say this kind of jokingly, but seriously, but it's not like God said, okay, you know, Jesus died, 
um, and hurry up and come because for the first 500, right, uh, you get a free pair of Ginshu's sake knives if you order now, right? So, you know, but after 500, sorry, you know, we're done. Um, the, the offering is to any who will come. And that's one of the things that I would encourage. Um, and I'll go back and, and say, you know, uh, this might be a spot where you speak with someone and they might say, but yeah, you just don't know. Like, I mean, I've, I've done so much wrong or I'm so far from God or how could God forgive me of X? I've done X, Y, and Z, right? And this is where you would want to just sit and say, look, you know, as we look at this verse, what is stated is to as many who choose, okay? So you are not beyond the reach of God's grace. You are not so sinful that God says, Oop, I cannot deal with you. It is anyone who will come and receive. But the other thing that I want to reiterate and the other thing that I want to camp on that I think is beautiful is it doesn't just say to as many who receive him, he will save them, right? Yes, he does. But the, the, the other thing that boggles my mind is not like God says, okay, you know, um, you sinner, I gave you my son and you've chosen him, so now you're saved, right? You're no longer guilty, but get away from me. I don't want anything to do with you. Go on and live your life independently of me. You know, I've done enough. Um, I never want to see you again, right? We read there, he gives us the right to be what? Children of God. And so the other part of that is to realize and help the individual see the heart of the Father and the intimacy that we have in him. That God is not this far off distant being, you know, that if we're, you know, not holy, he is just waiting to like strike us down with a lightning bolt. Um, God is also not someone who says, great, I've done my thing, but I can't be bothered with you. Um, a child of God, and you know, you've heard me say this in, in messages, what does that mean? Well, you are adopted into God's family. You are his son or his daughter. You are his prized possession. And so in that, recognize that we can come as a child to the Father who gives us good gifts, but also then go back and recognize because we're adopted into the family and we are a son or a daughter of a king in the kingdom, what do we become? Heirs to the promise. And therein is the transaction that we receive, recognizing that as a child who is heir to the king, okay, now we do not become king, but we are a child of the king, and therefore we are heirs to the kingdom that is his. Um, and so, not only do we get saved, for lack of a better word, but we become a child, we have the relationship, and then we get full rights and privileges of the kingdom of God. I mean, it, do, it just doesn't get any better. Okay? Um, so, to as many as who receive him, and then we'll slide over here. And what does um, this mean to receive Christ? Okay, and again, this is where... Um, I, I want to be careful. Um, I am not minimizing um, salvation or the sinner's prayer or the need of a savior, but also um, one of the things that I think is so important is that there is so much more to the Christian life than just coming forward and praying a prayer and calling it good, okay? Although that's hugely important, okay? But what we're going to discover is that beyond that, there is a turning away from certain things and a turning toward God. And this is where we're driving um, in these next couple of verses. So what does it mean to receive Christ? And again, for those that are um, following on video, we've just flipped over and we're on page uh, 27 of our study. Um, we're at the top of the page. So record the following verses um, in the space provided. Uh, then using the information found on those pages, we're going to develop essentially a definition for uh, what it means to receive Christ. So the first one we're going to look at um, is Mark 8, 34 and 35. So Mark chapter 8, 34, 35. Okay. Kent, you've got it. Awesome, thank you. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. 
For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. Awesome, thank you. Okay. So, essentially there, what you would want to have a student understand is that we are called to die to myself or essentially deny self. So deny ourselves or die to myself. In parentheses, let go of my independence. Right? And what's interesting here, right? We've talked before in the study uh, what was the definition of sin? What was the desire to live independently from God, right? Well, notice here the exact change is to let go of our independence and then say, you know, Lord, you're, you're mine. So, die to myself, deny self, let go of my independence, and then and follow him. And then in parentheses, it's stated following means to seek a relationship with Jesus. Right? So again, I'm not belittling the, the sinner's prayer. That is a key part. But what we have to realize, it's not you just pray and you get saved and you're like, great, awesome, thanks, I'm done. You know, um, I'll see you when I'm in heaven. Right? Um, we're called after receiving the gift to then say, you know what, this is good and this is important and you are a loving God and so I do not want to live independently of you. I want to live in relationship with you. And so that's the first one. Now we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 15, 3. So if someone has that, if they'd be willing to read 1 Corinthians 15, 3. You got it? Awesome. Thanks, Tom. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Okay. Thank you. And so here, what we would want the individual to see is that believe in Christ's death, which saves us from our sins, but then also sins that would have killed us is what he has. I mean, it's pretty, pretty blunt, but very, very true. So believe in Christ's death, which saves us from our sins, and those sins would have killed us. So now we're going to take a look at Romans 10, 9. And so would somebody be willing to read for us what Romans 10, 9 says? Got it, Lynette? Okay, awesome, thank you. Again, uh, for those that are in video, we're reading Romans 10, verse 9. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Awesome, thank you. Okay, very powerful verse, um, very st straightforward in a lot of ways. Um, but what we would want uh, the individuals to see is that um, they need to confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord. And so we're, we're after a confession. Um, and believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. Hence, he is alive. And notice those components in there. Um, number one, confession, okay, that Christ is Lord. Um, submission, essentially, reverence and awe. Believe in our heart, and um, essentially, what I would say is this is, you know, this is not a blase thing, like, oh, yeah, sure, whatever. You know, this is like, yeah, I get this. And, you know, again, I'm not God, you're not God, but I think we can, we can kind of have an understanding if the individual is. is doing this heartfelt or if this is just kind of a, you know, an appeasement or just whatever. But again, you know, that's between them and God. Um, and then the other thing that I think is important, that God raised him from the dead. Notice that that's in there. Um, and then the final thing that he says, he is alive, hence um, resurrection, right? Uh, we talked before about how important 
the resurrection is. And um, I said way back, you know, um, you can't have Christ without the cross, and you can't have the cross without Christ, which is wholly true, but you can't have any of that without the resurrection, right? Our whole hope, all of what we um, wait for, anticipate, pray for, desire, uh, rejoice in is the glorious resurrection and the promised return of our Savior Jesus. So we've looked at Romans 10.9, and now we're going to look at John 10.10. 10. So uh, John chapter 10, verse 10. You got it? All right. Ken's going to bring it home, and then we're going to summarize this. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Awesome. Thank you. The thief comes to steal, rob, and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Um, great words that we have from Jesus. And so here, what you would want the individual or student to see is that believe that Jesus has a better life for me than the one I am now living. Okay? Um, now, <laughs> um, I'm going to take a minute again, and what is better right? Um, I think some of us might look at it and say, gosh, you know, um, on a worldly level, you know, before I came to Jesus, my life was probably better. It was easier. I didn't have as many challenges or problems. Um, you know, even Jesus himself says, count the cost. So when you're doing this, I just want to reiterate, you know, be careful um, that they don't just say, great, you know, I'm in a pickle here, and so I'm going to say, great, Jesus, you know, you can be Lord because I want you to get me out of this pickle, right? Maybe, maybe not. But the better life that we're talking about is not necessarily a um, worldly or a secular better life. It is a deep life of a relationship with the maker and creator of the heavens and the earth who is our Father and our Savior, Jesus Christ, and the joy of the Holy Spirit that indwells us when we we place our faith and trust in him. Um, and, uh, you know, case in point, you might want to just use a testimony. You might want to use your personal experience and say, you know, hey, uh, prior to Christ, this is what was going on in my life. Post-Christ or after coming to Jesus, this is what's going on. And you might be real with them. You might say, um, you know, yeah, I've come to Jesus and, you know, it hasn't all been perfect. I haven't gotten all that I want when I want and how I want it. That's not what Christ has done. But to the joy of Christ and walking with him and him uh, walking with me and watching him in times of struggle or challenge and knowing that he's there and caring and um, trusting in his promises is the great relationship that we have. And um, the joy in that, and I've said it before, is um, your, how do I say this? I don't, I don't wish hurt or pain on anyone. That's not... But I would say the, the, the individuals where you watch and you see their joy in Christ, right? This just deep, um, undeniable joy. Um, nine times out of ten, they have gone through something that is gut-wrenchingly hard on a, uh, a worldly level. Um, but they have trusted Christ and watched him provide and... Uh, demonstrate his promises, hence this peace that passes all understanding is, is maybe the right way to say that. Um, so um, this one, if you guys would just take a time, I'm going to say it a couple of times because this is really where we're driving. So the last couple of scriptures are what we're getting to, and this is the culmination. What does it mean to receive Christ? Okay. Um, so receiving Christ means, number one, to turn away from my independence from God. So, number one, turn away from my independence from God. And then number two, to embrace Christ's death as a payment for my sins 
and then put a comma there, and I'll get you, you guys let me know when you've got that, and we'll finish the sentence. So number two, to embrace Christ's death as payment for my sins, comma, which brings forgiveness to my life. And then number three, to confess that Jesus is alive, and I uh, really appreciate that. Again, um, foundational aspect of resurrection um, and promised return. So confess that Jesus is alive and Lord of my life. Okay, loving relationship, you know, not distant, not. Um, this far off person that you can't talk to, not somebody that doesn't um, rejoice when you come. Um, So friendship, yes. But I also want to be careful um, that yes, Jesus is my friend. Yes, Jesus is my savior. But also submissively, right? Jesus is my Lord. Um, We're not on an equal playing field here. I don't get to tell God what to do, if that makes sense. Um, Okay, Um, and then number four. Does everybody have it? Everybody doing okay? Anybody need me to repeat anything? Okay. Um, So number four, um, to believe that that in Christ, uh, yes, to believe that in Christ is a better, more abundant life for me than I now have. And I love that because, again, um, what does abundance mean? Well, the more that we learn of who our Savior is and the great relationship we have with him, the less of the world we desire and the more of the kingdom we look to. Does that make sense? Um, and that is the abundance that we're speaking about, the abundance of the joy and the relationship of God. Abundant life, um, so many people would think, great, believe in Jesus, and abundant life means, you know, I'm going to die healthy, wealthy, and wise. Maybe. (laughs) Uh, That would be awesome, but there's no guarantee. And again, uh, we could say, you know, just look at uh, the disciples, and um, uh, I don't know about you, but um, I don't think any of them died healthy, wealthy, and probably wise, I would say, um, but I don't know that they died healthy, wealthy. So... Um, so that's really what we're after. So that, that's what we're driving. And then, um, again, and I appreciate you guys walking through this with me. These are fairly obvious questions for us, but this is where you would want to kind of take some time after spending um, the uh, time with the individual or individuals that you're taking through the study, going through these passages, developing sort of that definition. Um, and then we would go to sort of the kind of the clarifying or probing question pieces. And so um, here, we're not necessarily going to fill them in, but I'm just going to read them, and you would want to speak to the student about them. Um, And there's a side note that I've got in the leader's uh, manual. It just says that the teacher should walk the student through these final questions carefully and personally. Okay, so this is is where you just want to spend some time um, listening, um, encouraging, Maybe lovingly correcting or rebuking, you know, and again, I've said that before, they might say something that you're like, no, you know, that's not it, but um, again, be kind, be gracious, be loving, Um, you know, we're all seeking understanding, we're all working our salvation, for lack of a better word, um, in understanding what that means, Um, so be gracious to them if they're not necessarily getting the point, um, but also don't be afraid to say, um, no, you know, that, that's not exactly what happened. Um, this is why Christ did what he did. Um, so, um, the lesson has been helping us understand how one becomes a Christian. Now, using the data which we have accumulated, let's make some personal applications by answering the following questions. And the first one is, am I a Christian? Right? Great question. I mean, it's, it's just right there. I love that he, he just kind of, are you, are you a Christian? Okay. Non-judgmental. Um, you know, please understand this isn't kind of a, you know, got to know, um, but a great opportunity. And then say, great, you know, are you? So how did you become one? 
And again, you know, you're listening for a few key things here. Um, you know, if they said, well, um, I'm a Christian because my grandmother went to church. You know, I love you, but no. Um, and, and there's where you would graciously say, hey, you know, our salvation is not, as we've seen, dependent upon other individuals. It is a personal decision. But if they were to articulate the gospel and say, hey, you know, I realize that um, I was a sinner in need of a savior and I couldn't get to God on my own. Uh, I trusted in what Christ has done. I believe in him. I believe that he's risen from the grave uh, and I want to make him more to my life. Great, there we go. Um, and, um, you know, a derivative of that, um, you know, wonderful. Like keep moving in those general directions. Um, and then, um, if they're unsure, perhaps a more specific way of asking this question would be in asking the following clarifying question. So maybe they're struggling and you could just throw out, you know, hey, have you, have you decided or have you thought about giving up your life or my, it says here in the question, my life of independence from God? Right? We talked about that sin is a life that's independent of God. What do you think about that? Do you want to live independently from him? Or do you want to live in a relationship with him or dependent upon him? And that might then open up a couple more clarifying questions. Um, and then another one is important. Sure, I believe in God. Right? Well, a lot of people believe in God. But do you believe in Jesus? So the next clarifying one is, do I believe in Jesus Christ? Right? Well, what does that mean? And you could say, well, you know, have you accepted Jesus' death for your sin so that you might find forgiveness and escape the penalty of death which your sin brings? Okay? Obviously, this isn't a personal my because you're dealing, but um, you could be asking that. So another, you know, kind of, you're, you're just probing, clarifying questions, helping them to see. Um, and the next one, have I embraced Jesus as alive from the dead and Lord of my life? Right? Love that question. Um, again, you know, you're not getting away with, yeah, I believe in Jesus, but I don't believe in the resurrection. Because again, the foundational piece of the Christian faith, everything we hope for, everything we believe, rests upon the resurrection, which we talked about uh, a couple of weeks ago. And then the next one, do I now desire to follow Jesus for the better life, and I love how he puts it in quotes, he is right now offering me. And then it says, using these questions as a guide, let's again ask the original question. So you might circle back, am I a Christian? Um, and again, maybe not, right? That's okay, you know. Um, uh, I've said before, we plant and we water. We plant and we water, and we trust God to do the work. Um, you know, if there's some things that they're still working with, uh, care, love, concern, you know, go back, say, hey, can I help? How can we do this? I'm thinking, for, thinking of you, praying for you, and let God lead. Um, so, next thing is, um, in, in here, if a student says yes, right? Yes, I am, and you're like, wow, that's, that's awesome. My encouragement is, is to pray with him or her you know, immediately. Like, let's, you know, this is great. Like, let's not kick this can down the road. Um, and then you can offer the following prayer. And again, you know, this is just something if you're looking, um, something to the effect of, Jesus, I need you. I've gone my own independent way, rejecting your leadership over my life. I have sinned. And that sin has brought many deaths into my life. On the basis of your death for me, cleanse me from that old way of life. I commit myself to you so that I may receive from you a new way of life. I receive you as my Savior and Lord. Thank you for coming into my life because I have asked so in faith. Okay, again, you know, Essentially, the sinner's prayer, something to those lines. Um, and then obviously, um, recognize, uh, you know, when you're done, congratulate them um, and turn to them and say, hey, you know, you now have life. Uh, you have life uh, with our Savior, and God is not going to leave you nor forsake you. Praise God for it. And so, um, in summary, uh, what we'll kind of leave with this evening is as we said in the beginning of this lesson, 
when you become a Christian, there is a drastic reordering of your life. And you'll notice that I talked about that. We talked about that in the study. I talked about that in um, the sermons. Um, there's, there's a change now. Sometimes, you know, one person, it's literally night and day difference. Sometimes it's a slow progression. Um, but there is a reordering. There is a turning. There is a change. There is a difference. Um, not only do you commit yourself to Jesus as the only way to God, but you also submit yourself to a new way of living, right? And we'll stumble, we'll bumble, we all do. We all, at those times, you know, go back and desire that independent aspect and praise God for the grace and mercy of God, which is new each and every morning. Um, but I think what you're, what you're looking for is that heart that is, is turning away from individual worldly pursuit toward God and his kingdom. Um, and that's what we're after, hence sanctification, being separated for God. Um, you no longer do as you please, but what pleases him. It is this decision, a decision that says life cannot properly, excuse me, life cannot properly be lived apart from God, which forms the basis of relationship with God thereafter. This uh, is who the Christian is and how the Christian is to live. Okay? Um, the other thing too, and this isn't in the study, but I would um, say if you wanted to, you could take them to the end of Ecclesiastes if you wanted to, and you could help them see that you know, here is a book written by a person, um, and I would keep it simple. Um, if you want to go into more detail, you could, but here's a book written by an individual who basically had everything, didn't need anything more, and they review their life, and they look at everything, and what they've come to discover after doing so is, you know, I've come to discover that the chief end of man is essentially what? To obey God and to keep his commandments, to know God. This is really what we're made for. Um, so if you wanted sort of a scriptural backing there, um, you could utilize that um, as well. And so with that, um, you know, thank you for um, going through this portion. Uh, in just a second, I'm going to pray and we're going to conclude uh, this part of the study. And then next week, um, we are going to be looking essentially at um, the fifth lesson. We're going to be breaking that up into two more parts. And we're going to be looking essentially at... Um, what are our spiritual realities? So when we place our faith and trust in Christ, you know, what, what happens? What changes? Um, and we're going to be looking essentially at our new standing in Christ. So uh, what we once were, but now what we are. And then we're going to look at our new life in Christ. Um, we're going to kind of realize um, kind of what Christ wants to do in us and how he wants to sanctify us and set us apart. And then we're going to um, then look at um, essentially the present realities that we have in relation to eternity. Uh, what does it look like uh, on an eternal level? And then um, kind of the final thing is, is how we can encourage them to grow in their new life with Christ. And so we're going to talk about um, what we said before, you know, knowing the Bible, uh, reaching out to God in prayer, establishing uh, Christian friendships or Christian mentors, yielding to the Holy Spirit, um, and then obviously um, encouraging them toward baptism, um, a proclamation of their faith. And then obviously we know at the end, the conclusion is essentially uh, the big words, follow me. So that's where we're headed toward, right? Um, well, let me pray. And again, thank you for it. And then we'll conclude tonight's study. Um, Father, um, just thank you again uh, for the men and women that have gathered here. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to utilize uh, Dr. Lewis's study. Uh, thank you for his work in it. And Lord, uh, I just pray that it would, A, encourage us that um, for many, I'm sure that this is um, kind of a review, but also um, in the review, I pray that it would just uh, stir our hearts to the, the joy and the blessing that we truly have in Jesus, um, the true love that's been displayed from the Father through the gift of the Son on our behalf. And also, Lord, I pray that in it, um, uh, you would just um, encourage us. Uh, thank you for the fact that we have a study that we can kind of walk individuals through, um, give them as the foundation of the Christian faith, um, encourage them in it. And even now, Lord, I just would be praying um, for the future. I pray that uh, we would be kind of going to you and saying, Father, you know, who in our uh, spheres of relationships or kind of in the worlds that we're in, uh, 
might there be someone out there uh, that we could engage in spiritual conversations with? And Lord, in it, um, if the Spirit leads, I pray that we would have the courage to say, hey, you know, would you be interested in doing one-to-one with me? Or would you be interested in learning more about Jesus? Um, and then in it, uh, may we just plant and water well, encourage them in it, but trust that you uh, are the one who uh, grows the fruit of your ministry. And so may all glory and honor be due to your name. Bless us this evening. Um, Give us a great night. And then, uh, Lord willing, as we come back Sunday to worship, I pray that that time would just be an encouragement to us as well. We thank you for your love, your mercy, and your grace. And we pray it in Jesus' name. We ask it by the power of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people say, amen.